where they're not exposed to the air and they become sore and sore as they grow. And that infection under the skin, it's like, a, it's like a, it's an abscess, it's like an offense that just grows and grows and it gets worse and worse. And what's needed for that sore is, is painful, it has to be lanced. It has to be cut, it has to be exposed to the air. It's painful, but it's necessary. And then after it's lanced, then the bacteria, the, 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 the bacteria like pus actually comes out, and sometimes it stinks. And, and, and you say, yuck, what was that inside of me? I should have gotten that out sooner. And that's a picture of what happens when, when another person uh, uh, has offended us. And we don't deal with it directly. It just festers inside and, and causes more and more emotional pain. And, it, and as it grows, it gets ugly. It gets dirty. And they're rotten, dirty, rotten thoughts of retribution. And they, 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 they start growing inside of us like a bacterial infection. And we, we just we hope it goes away. We hope it goes away on its own, but it doesn't. And it keeps growing and it gets worse. It's just like a bacterial infection. And lancing is necessary. And the Lord's going to explain in this passage here how you do that. How you lance the infection of an offense. That's what he's going to address here. And after it's lands, <coughs> there's such a relief. You know, the pus comes out and so forth that just like when you hit your thumbnail with a with a hammer, and, and then that the, that space under the the, the nail it, it just fills with blood, and then oh, there's a pain that's just something. And that blood's got to get released, and, and 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 I still remember today the first time I did that, I hit a I hit my thumb with a hammer. My mom, my mother, my mom got me a job with a construction company. <laughs> because she told them I was over six <coughs> feet tall and very muscular. They, they, they thought I was, this some, they were waiting for someone else to show up. And, I mean, and so they hired me, and, and I had to work on uh, building wooden concrete forms for an elevator shaft at UCLA. And, 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 and so they said, okay, now your job is, you have to get up there three stories up with a, on a six inch wall. <laughs> with a fall to the back and a fall to the front. But they said, don't worry, we're going to strap you with a safety strap. So if you fall, it will tell you. Know. So, you know, obviously I'm, I'm up there trying to, concentrating more on not falling off of this little six-inch ledge. And, and, I, and so, you know, I'm trying to nail these wooden forms. Definitely not a job for a Jewish boy. I don't have any idea why I was there. I was the only Jewish kid there. Then he doesn't matter. So I hit my thumb with this hammer, you know. Oh, it started to throb terribly. And, and I came down in pain. And, and he said, um, he said Here, here's a paper clip, here's a match. You just light up this paper clip till it's red hot and then burn it through your nail. You know, the blood. Yeah. Anyway, so I did that. Immediately the pain was really good, wonderful. I, incidentally, I didn't stay with that job. So. <laughs> <laughs> that experience, because, my, because, but, because later I got on the same elevator sh shaft up there. And I was again worried about 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 um, falling, so I ended up driving a nail straight through my hand. Don't ask me how I did that. Well, I did it. I was holding the hammer in my hand with the nails in my hand. When I swung the hammer, the nail went straight through my hand. It was such pain. And anyway, and I remember I came down and I drove back home and. I had to stop for gas at the mobile gas station, and I was in so much pain, I drove right into the gas pump. No. And anyway, so I quit that job. And I went framing houses at the top of Mobile and Canyon after that. But anyway, anyway, the point I'm trying to make with all this is, is to still remember that paper clip, when it reached the blood under my thumbnail, how the blood just seemed to squirt out. Uh, and, and, and it was an instant relief. You, you probably, none of you ever had an experience. Oh, some of you have. Yeah, okay, good. You got it, okay, you got it, okay, good. Anyway, I still have a deformation on my thumb, doesn't matter. Anyway, so, just a lance of an abscess, just like that hot pepper clip, is necessary to relieve the pressure. Get out, the Lord's instructing this way he's telling us to do. He says in verse 15, If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So, this is the same instruction that Jehovah Jesus gave to the children of Israel in Leviticus 19.17. Leviticus 19.17, where he said, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. 
Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Now those are very interesting instructions because he says when offense happens to us, that's the time that we need to watch our heart very carefully. We have to be on a heart watch. We have to watch our heart to not hate the offender because we're told in no uncertain terms in Leviticus 19.17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart when an offense happens. We have to address this offense with the person who offended us. And, 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 and maybe you'd be like me and you'd just say, well, I don't like conflicts. I don't want to, I don't like it to be confrontational. I'd rather have lunch instead. <laughs> but we have to do it because we're told in no uncertain terms again in Leviticus 19.17, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. But we have to watch our hearts very carefully to not sin. It says it not sin because of him. Because again, that verse, Leviticus 19.17, tells us in no uncertain terms, you shall not suffer sin upon him. That means you should not let that offense cause you to sin. We have to be on a heart watch against that. We have to watch our hearts to, to, to not want to get even. You know, to not, to, because we're told again in no uncertain terms, Leviticus 19.17, thou shalt not avenge. That means don't get even. We have to be on a heart watch to not hold an offense against them. Say, okay, I won't get even, but I'm never going to forget. I'm going to hold a grudge. And we're told in no uncertain terms again, Leviticus 19.17, not bear any grudge against the children of thy people. So, and then we, 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 have to, we have to watch ourselves, watch our heart very carefully, because we're told that no uncertain terms, when this happens, when a person does this to us, in Leviticus 19.17, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That means that we're, we're, we, that, that we're to envision ourselves as helping the offender, as wanting to help him to recover himself. Now, when we hear all these in no uncertain terms, that, that we're not to hate our the, the offender, that we're, that, that we're to go to him directly to try to get him to recover, that we're not to let any sin, uh, not, not, avoid sin because of him, we're not going to, we, we, we should not want to get even, we should not hold it against him, and, and that we, we should love him. Those are hard. That's hard enough. That's very hard. But again, when we hear it, no uncertain terms that we're to love the offender, that's over the top. You see, that's over the top, and we fire back with, with a, you know, no uncertain terms. When we fire, love the offender, we fire back with, says who? Says who? And that's why right after all those commands in Leviticus 19.17, especially the one that says, love your offender, and we respond with, says who? If the Lord says, I'll tell you who says who. Leviticus 19.17, it ends with, I am the Lord. So, that's the says who to all these especially, especially the last command to love in no uncertain terms. And at this level, the goal is to keep remembering, he is my brother. And I need to pull him in closer to me and not push him away farther from me because he is my brother. And, and this, is the, this is the level here of, of, of loving him and not hating him. And it's this, and so this gives the context for what the Lord is saying here, in that the first level of reconciliation is done privately. Privately. Because, it, because the goal, it, it, and the very best, is to not see this escalate to a higher level. But a private meeting occurs, and it's so important. And so, and we're told to do this privately, and the scripture is very clear about this. In Proverbs 25, 8, Proverbs 25, 8, where it says, Go not hastily to strive, lest thou know what, not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself, and discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth thee put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. So the first thing it says there in Proverbs 25.8, Proverbs 25.8, is it says, 
The first instruction when we're offended is Proverbs 25, 8, go not forth hastily to strive. So the command is don't do anything at first. Don't jump in because normally a jump in and go hastily is, is, is a jumping in to fight. And that's why Proverbs 25, 8 says, go not forth hastily to strive to <coughs> fight. So the goal here, again, is to win over the offender, not to beat him up. And, and the purpose here is to love, not to teach a lesson to. And so when we feel this desire to fight, to strive, that, that needs to die down. That needs to die down. That's why there needs to be a cooling down period. I mean, when you, uh, um, how many of you have an instant pot? I have an instant pot. I love instant pots. I'm a big promoter of instant pots. I have so many instant pots. Anyway, an instant pot pressure cooker, as you know, there are two ways to let the steam out go. One way is to release the quick release, the, you know what I'm talking about, the quick release on the top, and then you better stand back because a blast of steam is going to come shooting out. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. As a matter of fact, I bought the little silicon thing that fits over that, that shoots it away from you. <laughs> and, and the other way, as they call it the natural way, I think they call it the natural way. And that's where it, you don't open the steam valve, but you, you just let it sit there and you wait for the steam to disappear. And, and, and it does, it's amazing, it disappears and it's where the steam go. And then you can open it and, 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 and after some time you might have to wait. Well, it depends, if you fill the whole thing up, you might have to wait an hour, you know, but normally it doesn't take that long to wait. And, and so when we've been offended, we're like the instant pot you know, it's a pressure cooker. We're full of steam. It's hot. And what Proverbs 25, 8 is saying here, not going out for hastily to strive, is that when we're offended, be like the instant pot and leave it in the natural mode. And just let the steam pressure just disappear on its own. And don't touch that quick release, that quick release valve there, because then words of, will be spoken in anger, and, and it's going to be trouble. So when a person has offended us, the last name we want to call him is my brother. We don't want to do that. But this is exactly the name that Christ used for the person who offended us. He says, because he says, when thy brother hath offended thee. That, that's what the Lord wants, him to, wants us to see him as, my brother. He doesn't want us to fight with him. And the closer a person is, as in a brother, the more difficult it is to fight with the person. That was a problem when we were over in the war department in World War II. In World War II, was it a problem to get the American soldiers to fight against the Japanese because the Japanese are so different from the Americans and they were not viewed as relatives? But there was a problem to get the American soldiers to fight against the Germans because the Germans, you know, there's a lot of German relations here. And the Germans were seen as relatives and like brothers. So the War Department started to come up with these derogatory terms like, you know, the Krauts and the Jerry's and whatever. They try to get the Americans to not see the Germans as so close as brothers. So here, though the Lord is, is pushing to not have a fight, so he wants the offender to be seen as, in verse 15, verse 15, thy brother. Now, the first approach or the spirit that you and I need when we approach an offender is very important. And the position that we take with the offender is essential. And that's why in Proverbs 25, 9, Proverbs 25, 9, it says, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. The correct position is, is a debate. A debate with is the word that's used, debate. A debate with is not a lecture to straighten someone out. A, a, a debate is not a, is not a set the record straight. A debate is not a fight. A debate is like a back and forth, a friendly conversation. It's a, where, where you try and understand why was done what was done. See, when, when Proverbs 25, 8 says, debate thy cause with thy neighbor, it means to not come on accusing the offender with words of, you did this and you were wrong. When Proverbs 25, 8 says, debate thy cause, it means to explain 
in gentle terms, how you feel. Something like, you know, you made me feel very sad. And not you, it, it, sorry, that made me feel very sad. Not you made me feel sad. That made me feel disappointed. Not you disappointed me. That, that made me feel wrong. Not you wronged me. So you're simply telling thy cause. How, how, how you felt without directly, directly, of course there's an indirect accusation there, but it's not direct. Because the goal is gentle. A gentle approach because the hope is that the offender will be recovered who's fallen. And then... So important when Proverbs 25 8, 25 8 says, discover not a secret to another. That means go, don't tell anyone else about what he did. It, once we tell another person how, how we've wronged, how we've been wrong, how he's wronged us, then what we've done is we've painted the picture of how that offender is a horrible person. And, and, and that sets that person in concrete. And our goal is for that person not to be. A horrible person. So Proverbs 25 8 emphasizes don't tell anyone else of, uh, 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 <coughs> about how he's offended you. And then when we're offended, what's the first thing that happens? We get angry. I mean, the hair on the back of our neck raises up, which is a result of pride. That's pride. We come to the offender, if we come to the offender in the spirit of debate, we want to hear his side of the story. And we want to, and, 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 and we reflect on, uh, 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 on that. That requires humility on our part, humility. We come to the defender with the goal of wanting to see the outcome of what the Lord is saying here in verse 15, verse 15. Thou hast gained thy brother. That means we're trying to help him to recover from his sin. And so to come in the spirit of humility <coughs> means we're trying to, we, we would like to, actually be a living picture for the offender to look at and to see how he should be. In other words, it takes humility to, for the offender to say, you know what, I was wrong, and I'm sorry for what I've done. That takes humility. So the more we come to him or her in the, in the, in the spirit of humility, I mean ourselves being humble, the more we're trying to lay out a carpet for the offender to walk down. This is the way, not proud of how dare you do that to me. So, after instructing us to be gentle with an offender, Proverbs goes on to say, in Proverbs 25, 11, Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. So it's, so, so the whole thing's all about the words. The whole thing's all about the right words to say to an offender in, in, that starts off by saying, go not forth hastily. In other words, take time to think about what you're going to say. Take time to come up with the perfect words, the right words to say. And those words that we say to a person who's offended us need to be, Proverbs 25, 11, a word Fitly spoken, fitly spoken. Now, in Hebrew, in this, this verse, Proverbs 25, 11, the word wheels appears, wheels. So, really, when it says a word fitly spoken, it literally means a word upon its wheels. A word on its wheels. That means a word, the words used should glide along naturally. They should just glide along like words on a wheel that run smoothly along, as opposed to, to, to words that are not on wheels and that, that do not flow smoothly and have to be forced and dragged along, making deep ruts in the road as they go along. But, but words that glide along on wheels are, are not harsh words, they're not rough words, that produce a shock to the ear and, and produce a painful ruts in, in, in the memory of the, of the hearer. But words that glide along on wheels, are they're, they're not words of passion. They're not words of anger. They're not words of strain and violence. But words that glide along on wheels are words of calmness and gentle words. Words that glide along on wheels are polite words. 
coming from a person who knows how to control his temper, not not and not say things that hurt feelings or that leave a a, a, a painful sting behind. Words that glide along on wheels, that they just roll smoothly off the lips to the ear. Words that glide along on wheels are, are words that are spoken to an offender that might start with a word of praise of that offender for, wherever, for whatever, for what is worthy to be praised. A word that glides along on wheels that, that's spoken to offender might start off with, you know, I really appreciate this about you. Something. Or, or you know, I meant to tell you that I've admired this about you, uh, that, that's a word that, that's on wheels, it glides along nicely. Proverbs says that, that to have words like that is to have words that, that Proverbs describes as apples of gold in pictures of silver. You know, Middle Eastern craftsmen, they, they did marvelous things with, with strands of silver. They, they, they would use these kind of string, strands of silver and They'd solder them together and weld them and into bowls of uh, animals, for example, where you could see every joint of the animal and every, every clear little detail. Just beautiful, beautiful, They're all made with silver strands. Uh, an apple, an apple is, is a symbol of goodwill. As a matter of fact, there's a Jewish custom in Rosh Hashanah at, young, uh, at uh, the New Year's is to eat apples and honey at the new year. Why? Because apples symbolize goodwill, and the idea is that apples and honey should reflect the desire that in the coming year that we should have a sweet new year of God's goodwill. There, there was a custom in Greece and Athens that a newly married couple, that, that after the celebration of their marriage night, when they, when they were first alone together, that the first thing they should do is eat an apple together as a token of their goodwill toward each other for the rest of their lives. So when it says in Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver, it means that a, a word which glides along on its wheels should reflect a goodwill to the hearer. And when we speak to a person who's offended us, we should have a goodwill for that person. So to have the right words that, that glide along on wheels, we need God for that. We need God to give us those right words to say to the person who's offended us. Now, when another person has offended us, our first inclination is to say, well, that's fine. I'll just sit here and wait for that person to come back, come to me and apologize. I am owed an apology. But that's not what Christ is commanding here. He says in verse 15 that we are to take the initiative. In verse 15, he says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So we're not to sit back and wait for the offender to come to us. We're to go and tell him his fault. We're to tell the offender his fault, but not with passion, but instead by using, using reason, trying to use reason. This is coming in a spirit of love. What love does is it gives the benefit of the doubt. Love stretches to give the benefit of the doubt. Now, to give the benefit of the doubt is to believe that the offender just simply has a blind spot and, 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 and doesn't realize what he's done. Even though that might be hard to believe. That this is, it, it, it might be hard to believe. Love believes those things that are hard to believe because the definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it says that love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So those are four actions of love. Beareth, believeth, hopeth, and endureth. So when it says that love beareth all things, it means that love's, love holds up under the stress of an offense, doesn't lose it. When it says that love believeth all things, it means that love believes things that are hard to believe. But nevertheless, love believes that, well, the offense was just a blind spot. He didn't mean it. We all have blind spots. We all have blind spots in our lives. We need others to come and tell us what we've done wrong. And then when it says when love hopeth all things, it means that love 
hopes to the point of actually envisioning that offender as repenting and turning around. And then when it says that love endureth all things, it means that love is willing to be patient, endure, and try, try multiple attempts to get the offender to repent. So, going on now, into next verse 16. Failing to work, failing to get the offender to repent, the, 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 now the direction is to bring one or two other witnesses. And the choice of who to bring is very important. It should be somebody who's cool-headed, it should be somebody who's objective, who's not your best friend, going to support you no matter what, but someone who is likely to be not biased, unbiased. So the, the idea behind bringing one or two others is for, 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 is for the, each person, the offended person and the offender, to, 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 um, to, to have another person hear the words, to hear the words that each person is saying. And, and the best way to hear your own words and what another person is saying is just to, to, to look at another person, one or two others, who are hearing those words and seeing their reaction. That's like, that's like, that's like reading subtitles scrolling away, just like right now. As I'm speaking to you, if I could see over there a scroll of subtitles of everything I've said, but actually I have it here, so I, I know what it is. But anyway, but but the issue here is the importance of the words that are spoken. Words determine how a matter will go. They're very important, and which is why we need to those words that are like Proverbs 25:11, a word on its wheels is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And now. In the course of our 45 plus years at Scannabody's Laboratory, I am unhappy to say that we have been, and actually are in now, several lawsuits. And so I never wanted to learn about lawsuits, but, uh, but, I, but I got that kind of force. And what I learned is what happens so often, most of the time in a lawsuit, is there are depositions. And depositions is where a lawyer sits you down and asks you questions, which sometimes can go on for six, eight hours. I was in one of ten hours, where you're just being asked questions for ten hours. It's, ex it's grueling, it's exhausting. Because everything you say is being recorded, sometimes with video, not just what you say, but how you express it when you say it, and then you need to get into court, and somehow there's this 12-foot-tall screen of your face and the expression on your face when that question was asked, you know. Of course, they never, they, ne they, never, they never show the first part of, well, so how often do you beat your wife? And then you get that shocked look, that's what they show, but anyway. Um, and at the end of the deposition, at the end of the deposition, you receive a transcript of the questions that were asked and your answers. And that transcript is, well, I've seen them be, uh, be 200 pages. And, 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 so, and you'll be asked, to read that transcript and confirm that that's what you said. And I can tell you that sometimes I've read the transcript and I've said, is that what I said? <laughs> you know, what was I thinking? Or what was I not thinking? And, and, and that results in, next time I've got to think more before I speak and use better words and not say things that didn't come from thought but, and not say things that just came from I mean, say things that came from thought and not say things that just came from emotion. So, what happens when you bring one or two of these witnesses to meet with an offender is that you can see how, you, how, how, how the words that each person is saying is being transcribed in the minds of these one or two witnesses. And that should result in more thought given before speaking. It, so when it says in, in verse 16, verse 16, when Christ said, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. That's what it's talking about. The words. The words. And as a matter of fact, the Greek there for establish is the word to stand. To stand. And when you sign that deposition, that's it. That's it. You just say it, and, and you, can, you can sit there and say, well, I never said that. Then they'll come with recording. And they'll say, this is what you said. 
So you, you, it's not like you can take the just says, no, I, I'd like to change that. I didn't want to. No, let's, let's just scratch that from the record. You can't do that. So it's, it, those, those, those words of that deposition, they stand, and they'll be used in court. And in, in, in other words, what is said with the witnesses is the official position of each person. And so this idea of having witnesses, this isn't, this isn't new to the book of Matthew. Moses said this in Deuteronomy 19.15, Deuteronomy 19.15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinned. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. In other words, stand. Then, so, so in other words, the idea here is that after you meeting with the person who's offended you, instead of just giving up, he said, you, you go to the next try. And the next try is one or two others. Now, Christ is focusing on the best outcome of an encounter between the offender and the offended, and that outcome is, in verse 15, in verse 15 the outcome is, if he shall hear thee, if he shall hear thee. Now, if that happens, it's wonderful. And in verse 15, thou hast gained thy brother. And James refers to that in James 5.19, James 5.19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So James speaks here of converting of a soul or in a, as another place in the Bible calls it, the winning of the soul. The Bible speaks of winning of souls in Proverbs 11.30, Proverbs 11.30, where it says, The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Now, we think of soul winning as bringing the lost to Jesus Christ. They are converted to Jesus Christ. But here, winning a soul is bringing around a person who has offended us to the point of gaining that brother again. And the wise person sees an offense against him as an opportunity to recover a lost soul. He doesn't just look at it from a little cocoon of, what did he do to me? He looks at it from a bigger picture, what is his position with Christ that, 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 that enabled him to do that? What has he done to Christ? And so that, that it's not just an, entertain, just, not just an opportunity to reconcile between me and him, it's, a recon it's an opportunity to see him reconcile with God, a greater issue. The issue here is that a soul is of great value to God, and we should work hard to recover a lost soul. Because if the loss of a soul is a great loss, the gain of a soul is a great gain. Now, there's always the very real possibility of failure, of failure, in which case, verse 16, verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So in the end, there's no guarantee that a person, even though he might have presented to him the most gliding words on wheels, the best words possible, there's no guarantee he's going to hear, no, no guarantee he's going to convert from a sin. It all still comes down to the choice of the person, as it does for every sinner who hears the gospel. It's the ultimate decision of the sinner. To choose to hear God calling him or not. And if this offender does not respond to the, our best efforts to, to make our words glide along and as a beautiful picture uh, uh, as we can, of apples of gold and pictures of silver, we're not to give up because a soul is worth fighting for. And we have the problem that we are that, that when we read a passage like this. We just rush to the last step and we want to expose to the church and see him kicked out of the church. But God has a different focus to try and to try and to try and to try to recover that brother and not see him kicked out of the church. And that's the strategy behind this verse 15. That's the idea of the strategy behind verse 15. Paul spoke about his fighting and fighting and fighting to recover brothers in Christ when he wrote in Galatians 4.19, Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Travail again? If you had asked a mother, would you like to travail again for that 
child, let's see, no way. No way. That's a painful contractions all over again until the baby is finally born. I want that to be the once and for all and done. But to work with souls is, is to do what Paul said in Galatians 4.19, travail in birth again. And that's what this verse 16 is all about. It's another attempt to bring a person to repentance. And the Lord here gives a number. He gives a number of how many witnesses you're to bring. He says, take with thee one or two more. The number he gives is one or two and no more. Now, why one or two and no more? The reason is because sin is shameful. And God has designed shame as a prod to bring a person back to God. Christ described sin already in verse 12, in verse 12, as went astray. Went astray when he said in verse 12, How think ye if a man have a hundred sheep? And one of them be gone astray. Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? So the picture that he's painting here is just gone astray. And Christ has designed shame to be like a prod that brings a person back in line. Back in line and stops him from continuing to go astray. And the less that people know about his sin the easier it is for him to repent and to come back in line again. And that's why, that's why the Lord is being so careful to not see the circle of exposure widen, but to keep it as small as possible when he, says, when he said in, in, first, in verse 15, if thy brother is trespassed against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And then... And, and, the word alone is the key here. It's the key here. That means that when we've been offended, we're not to jump on the phone and say, do you know what he did to me? That, that, that's what he's saying. The word alone means that, that, that when we've heard about an offense of someone else, that's the time for us to go out in the backyard, get the shovel, and bury it. And, 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 and not to get on the phone and say, do you know what he did to him? So when the Lord uses this verse alone, in verse 15, the Lord is telling us that when we know about an offense, either because we've been the offended one or we've heard about an offense, that that is the time to get out the covering cloth, the covering cloth, and, and just lay it over the sin because that's what love does. Love uses the covering cloth. In 1 Peter 4, 8, 1 Peter 4, 8, above all things, have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Now the opposite of love is hatred. And hatred in comparison to love is described, described in Proverbs 10.12, Proverbs 10.12, where it says, Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. So hatred broadcasts sins. Hatred makes other people angry at a person for what they've heard that he's done. Hatred stirs up strifes. See? But, uh, but it says in Proverbs 12, 16, Proverbs 12, 16, a fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. Now, why is a fool's wrath presently known? It's because the fool has gone around telling everyone why he's so angry with a person who's offended him. And for that reason, the Bible calls him a fool. And in contrast to a fool is a prudent man who says, covers shame. The man who covers the shame is an offender. He's called, uh, uh, the man who covers the shame of an offender is called a prudent man. Because the covering of sin is what God does when he forgives sin. The Hebrew word for atonement is kippur, as in day of atonement, Yom Kippur. And the word kippur means covering. So when you see when you see an observant Jewish man and he's wearing a, a, a yarmulke or a kippah, it mean, it, that means covering. And when God forgives our sins, he covers our sins. And <clears throat> after all, we have a very basic question to ask in the Bible is, how could God call anyone righteous when, when the truth is, Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God. Well, the first person in the Bible that God called righteous was, was, the, was Abel. Abel, as it says in Hebrews 11.4, Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. So, that mean, meant that, okay, Abel was a sinner. A sinner is not righteous. Abel, but if Abel was a sinner, then how could God call him righteous? Well, it was because... Hebrews 11, 14 says, he obtained witness that he was righteous. Well, how could he obtain the title of being righteous when he is a sinner? Because Abel brought the blood sacrifice to God. Abel believed that God would forgive his sins through the blood sacrifice, which Cain did not bring. And when Abel brought the blood sacrifice, then God covered Abel's sins, and with Abel's sins covered, Abel was righteous. Because that's what God does, and that's what God loves to do, cover sins. And if we go broadcasting a sin that someone has done, then we're working against what God is doing and what God loves to do, which is cover sins. Because God loves to see peace. God wants friendship with himself. Friendship's a big word with God. He loves friendship between people also. And Proverbs 17.9, Proverbs 17.9 says, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. So the more that people are told about a wrong that a person has done, the harder it is for that wrongdoer not only to be converted through repentance, and it's, it, and, 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 but it's not easy to resist telling others about a multitude of sins, but it's worth it because of, because of James 520 that we saw, James 520 that we saw, which is the he that converteth a sinner shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. But when a, a sin is broadcast, friendships dissolve. Friendships he has separated very friends. And God doesn't like that. So how could how how, how so this, so okay. <clears throat> now okay. Right. So now the Lord changes the word here that he's using to describe the response of the offender. First of all, if you notice in verse 16, if he will not hear thee, if he hear thee, hear thee. See, that's the response, hear thee. Now, just before the offended person, that the, 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 the offender, when the offended person stands in front of the offender, it's a, matter, it's a matter of his will. It's a matter of his will. He has chosen not to hear him or he's chosen to hear the offended person. But when the offended person is now in front of, not just the offended person, but also in front of one or two others, and he won't respond, it's, it's not that he's chosen with his will not to respond. It's a matter of, in verse 17, and here's the change of words, he shall neglect to hear. So first it's will not hear, now it's neglect to hear. Now the word neglect, <clears throat> with the word neglect, Christ has added a new dimension to describe the sin. The sin has now risen to a new level, and this is the level of neglect, as in, I don't care. I don't care what these others think I have done. I'm not gonna I, I, I'm not gonna respond. I'm gonna persist in my position, and I'm not wrong. To, ne that, to neglect means to disrespect. Disrespect. So in other words, I have no respect for this other person who's been brought in, or these two other people who've been brought in. That's neglect. And the presence of these one or two other witnesses is designed to appeal to the person's mind because it's an attempt to try it and, and get the person to reason himself out of his sin. So this whole area of the subject from verses 15 to 20, verses 15 to 20, on how to deal with the vendor, is not meant for us to have a way to hurt or counter uh, the offender. The whole subject here in verses 5 to 15 to 20, has to be looked at in the context of this whole chapter. And the central theme of this chapter is verse 11. Verse 11, the Son of Man is come to seek, is come to save that which is lost. He's come to save that which is lost. So when we're, when we're offended, we're hurt, we're angry, we have to set, set that aside and see that if this offender is not brought to repentance, 
then this is an indication that this offender is lost. And the position of Christ with regard to the lost is verse 11. Verse 11, the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. So the goal of these verses, 15 through 20, is not to condemn. Not to condemn, it's to save because John 3.17, John 3.17, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the goal of bringing in the one or the two other witnesses is to have the person respect the views of the other witnesses. Now, because after all, maybe the offender has some particular problem with the person he's offended, and that's the reason he doesn't respect him. So if that's the case, then the other witness or witnesses are there so that he can respect them and, and, and see how wrong he's been. But if the offender decides to not hear them, then that means that the sin is, is, is risen to this level of not respecting them. And the act of not respecting them, like I said, is described by the word neglect, which is the same word that's used in verse 17, like it says. And if that occurs, the offender has disrespected the one or two witnesses, and then he has neglected to hear them. And Christ said, now take it to the next level. And the next level is verse 17. If you neglect to hear them, verse 17. If you neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, let it be unto thee as a heathen man or publican. So again, the goal, the goal here is always in this chapter, verse 11, the saving of the lost, offended. And from, and, and verse 12, to, to get him to stop going astray. And that's the reason for bringing this man's sin to the attention now of the whole church. And the goal here is for the person to respect the church's view, which represents Christ. The church represents Christ from Colossians 1.20. Colossians 1.20. Christ, uh, uh, his body, say, which is the church, which is the church. So by telling you the church, the goal is for the person to see that, that Christ is against his, his sin and for him to turn around. But, but this is only the last resort, and only if he refuses to respond to the church and as a whole is the man to be treated, as it says in verse 17, as a heathen or a publican. And when it says that he is to be treated as a heathen man and a publican, we have to keep in mind Matthew 9.10, Matthew 9.10, which says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with them as disciples. So Christ welcomed publicans and sinners to be with him because Christ saved publicans and sinners. So when it says that this man is to be treated as a publican or a heathen or a publican, that's not meant as a final declaration of his eternal state, of his doom. That simply meant that he has dropped back down to the state that he was in before he came to Christ. is in that state of savable and, and a candidate to be saved. Now it's interesting here that Christ refers to the church which simply means a congregation. It's a congregation, it's a kehalat in Hebrew, it means a group of believers. And the church is important to Christ because he said in Matthew 16, 18, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Christ is going to build his church, he's going to fight to build his church against the gates of hell, against the powers of hell, and the purity of his church is also very important to him. And he gives a tremendous authority to the church in verse 18. Verse 18, when he says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's referring here to the decision of the church regarding this brother who refuses to repent of his offense. He's leaving it up to the church and to their decision. And he's saying, if the church decides that this, 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 this brother, who has not repented, should be bound and not be a part of the church, then Christ is saying that in heaven there will be heard an amen, and that there will be a ratifying decision in heaven. On the other hand, if the church, it, 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 he's saying that if the church then subsequently decides to loose that brother and then allow him back into the fellowship with the church again, then again there will be heard in heaven the hearty Amen, and that decision will be ratified in heaven. That's a tremendous authority that Christ has given to the church. Now, we know there are some churches of thousands, and there are some churches with a very small number. And so Christ now clarifies the minimum number for a church 
to make such decisions. And that number is in verse 19. Verse 19, again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done in heaven. It will be done for them with my fathers in heaven. So even if a church only has two persons in it, then that qualifies them as the church, which, by the way, qualifies us here at Mission Valley Community Chapel. We have, it, we have that number. But when he said, they shall ask, in verse 19, they shall ask, it shows that such important decisions about what to do with a person who refuses to repent is not made by the church in a vacuum. It's a matter of asking prayer for, from God for direction. It's a matter of prayer for the church. And then he gives an assurance for the church to not be afraid to take a decision. Not be afraid to take a decision, as he says in verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. So in that verse, he's saying he's very much present in the church in guiding and in standing behind the church, even if the church is only made up of two persons. If just two persons are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, that's a church, whether they have a church building or, or not. And as a church, he says he's in their midst. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for our Lord Jesus Christ and the patient, Lord, patient way in which he uh, guides and instructs us and in the and in the loving way in which he promises to be with us even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.